Good morning. Welcome to the Link Ventures Investor Spotlight. So we have investors and industry professionals joining us from around the globe. So we want to thank you for taking time out of your day to attend this event. I'm your host, Tim Lazat with Green Life Capital, and I'm joining you from Las Vegas, Nevada. A little bit about Green Life Capital. We are empowering private equity, small market companies by providing one-stop full spectrum capital solutions. With our working relationships with family offices, ultra high net worth individuals and private wealth, we are currently lending from 250,000 to 50 million. Our loan products consist of growth capital, working capital, business term loans, commercial real estate loans, purchase order and revenue based loans and more. Some of our products that are offered are not consumer loans. In California, loans are made pursuant to the California Finance Lenders Law License and are made by licensed California, uh, California Lenders Law License. Our mortgage loans that require national mortgage licensing registration uh, pursuant to the Safe Mortgage Act of 2008 are made by lenders registered by the NMLS. Uh, I know that was a lot. Uh, let me talk about Link Ventures. Link Ventures is a global platform for private opportunities, which showcases emerging companies to over 15,000 high net worth individuals, professionals, international investors, venture capital, private equity, family offices, and industry participants. So, so through a combination of their website and events, they provide opportunities and tailored matchmaking between private companies and investors. Private companies are able to showcase their company to potential investors or CEOs who are seeking acquisition targets. So events like this one attracts hundreds of investors who are actively seeking to make investments. And today we had over 170 registrants. A couple of housekeeping items uh, before we proceed. Two companies will be presenting today. First up will be eBumps in the ad tech space, followed by Tribe Herald in the digital media space. The presentations will immediately follow the housekeeping items with a brief introduction for each company. Each of the companies will have 25 minutes to present, including a Q&A portion. One of our companies was unable to join us today, so we've just limited it to these two companies. If you have a question for a presenting company, you may type your question into the Q&A. Um, the chat feature has been enabled. However, we do, do ask that you do not spam the chat uh, or present your questions in the chat. Please use the Q&A. Um, selected questions will be answered after the presenter has finished their presentation. And I will read the question and the presenter will have an opportunity to answer that question audibly. If you'd like to contact any of the companies uh, that you hear today, you can visit www.linkedventures.net. That's L I N K E D V E N T U R E S.net. I will also put this in the chat. Uh, for their contact information, you'll go under the current offerings, and you can also stay up to date with more upcoming events. Uh, we will have a poll or survey at the end uh, with the audience following the presentation to gauge how we're doing here. And your poll uh, questions will be anon your answers will be anonymous. The poll will go up after our last presentation and we'll allocate just a few minutes to complete that poll. Again, we wanna thank you for attending today and taking time out of your schedule. Uh, we encourage you to attend other events like this one and in-person events that are coming soon to cities like Las Vegas, Atlanta, and more. So now first up, we're going to hear from eBumps, led by CEO Jonah Tuckman. Uh, I have a brief introduction for him. eBumps is a company based out of New York. eBumps is delivering a new advertising platform for the 21st century. They provide companies with the opportunity to advertise on a revolutionary platform unlocking location-based advertising in a real world like never before. So by offering space on their e-bump to advertisers, drivers can get paid for the driving they already do. 
while supporting brands and missions that they believe in. I hope I didn't steal too much of your thunder, Jonah. So no. you are up next and we're looking forward to your presentation. All right, great. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, let me try and share my screen here. Hi everyone, my name is Jonah Tuckman. I'm the founder and CEO of eBumps. Um, eBumps serves an $8 billion market where we've identified roughly 22, uh, 227 million uh, licensed drivers who have not yet monetized their space. When we were founding this company, we initially identified a problem with the non-liquid and current advertising space that we see we see a difficulty to track a return on investment, a lacking liquidity in these advertising campaigns, and for the general person, a difficulty to monetize their personal space. From there, we built out a solution. This solution being 21 and a half inch LCD screens that we have mounted to the passenger side door of vehicles. These screens can average anywhere around 50,000 impressions a day, which then integrate alongside our proprietary software and advertising platform that allows us to uh, present uh, targeted ads and data collection to advertising agencies and companies. Because it's a rather new idea, we built a short video that I'd like to show that I think explains the, the idea quite well. eBumps is creating a completely new ad space, allowing drivers to be paid for work that they're already doing. We give advertisers the insight associated with digital advertisements and the attention-grabbing flair of outdoor ones by allowing them to advertise on the fleet of cars already filling the streets. Users can evaluate their ad campaigns in real time and see when and where people are interacting with them. This gives everyday drivers an additional source of passive income. By displaying our ads on your car, you get paid for the driving you already do. In an ever uncertain world, eBumps provides exciting new opportunities for everyone. We've identified the market size to be roughly $260 billion in terms of US advertising annual spending and 8.6 of this 8.6 billion of this being spent on outdoor advertising alone with 181 million dollars being spent on digital out of home programmatic advertising even with it being such a new field we've projected that by 2024 we can see roughly 300 million dollars in annual revenue which would be less than five percent of this total market share our business model is based on the selling of impressions and we're selling viewable CPMs in which we use our advertising platform to collect impressions as they drive through the streets of whatever city they may be in. And we then sell these impressions to advertisers and then compensate our drivers for the driving that they do. As of now, we filed a provisional patent and we've made strategic manufacturing partnerships with manufacturing firms such as AUO, a Taiwanese LCD manufacturer who also works with companies like Samsung and Tech Global, a Chicago-based system integration company who, who does the integration for companies like 3M, Motorola, and Delta. The competition, competition in the space right now are companies like Grabit, Firefly, and Halo, all of these being large and bulky permanent fixtures which require professional installation. Our systems are different as their low cost LCD screens can be easily installed without any professional installation and their lacking being a permanent fixture allows for the non-professional non driver to have use with the advertising business. We also provide advertisers with data collection and location targeting in the outdoor space, which is currently unseen. Our go-to-market plan for the drivers is originally with New York City taxis and then, and then additional drivers through guerrilla sales and marketing campaigns, and then SEO optimization through our marketing firm. As I say, we're originally launching in New York City, but from there we are launching in, we're planning to launch in cities such as Seattle, Vegas, Austin, Chicago, Boston, United States, and then more so nationally and then globally. We've partnered with a firm, Marketing360, who's taking the lead on our marketing force. They also work with companies like the Denver Broncos. And we've recently partnered with a company called Vistar Media, who's a programmatic advertising company who will be adding advertisements onto our screens once they're market ready. For the agencies, we are originally speaking to agencies through in-house and out-of-house sales teams. And we're using our marketing firm to lead that charge as well alongside sales teams that we have built. Our, funding team, our founding team is myself as CEO, 
Cole Johnson as the Director of Business Development and Corin Rose as our Chief Technology Officer. We're looking to raise $2 million in which this capital will go towards additional hardware cost to grow us from 25 screens to roughly 1600 screens by the end of the year or by the end of next year. And additionally, we have, we have work that we'd like to do in the sales and marketing side and then with further engineering purposes. And before I end, I'd like to show a quick video of the screens in their system. Thank you very much, everyone. And I'd love to take any questions that may come. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jonah. As we're waiting for some questions to come in, I just encourage you to type your questions in. They can be uh, typed in anonymously. Um, your questions can also be um, typed in with your name if you prefer us to uh, give a shout out as to who's asking the question. Um, I feel like uh, anonymous is a, a definitely a good way to go. So is, if you will uh, present your questions to uh, Jonah or eBumps, um, something that they can answer about their company or about the presentation they gave today. Jonah, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I do have some questions for you as well. Yeah. Um, my question to you is, as you're rolling out, um, starting in New York, how quickly do you think that you can roll out to these other states? And how many units do you project that that, that would require for you to have on the road? Yeah, so um, in December, we're, we're rolling out December 1st with 25 screens. And then we're putting the funds that we raised um, Right, really immediately into the order of uh, 500 screens that will be uh, either deployed in New York alone or in, in a variety of different cities. It's a decision that we're going to make as the time gets closer. Um, but what we found in New York specifically is when you are identifying taxi companies, um, rather than going driver to driver, you have the ability to partner with companies that bring 100, 300, 500 uh, cars in their fleet. And so we have the ability, especially in New York, to really scale quickly, because rather than speaking to one driver at a time, we're speaking to 100. And then when we are speaking to one single driver at a time, whether it be rideshare or the general public, we have different referral systems that we allow drivers to be further compensated for to allow that growth. Excellent. Um, so if, you, if I can remind you that if you can please put your Q&A in the Q&A, um, we can actually see your questions easier there. I am looking at the chat as well. And so I see some questions have come into the chat actually. So if you could please put your questions in the Q&A, uh, we would appreciate that. But I'm going to take some of these questions from the chat. Um, the first question is, um, on, on from the chat is uh, what about partnering uh, with Uber or Lyft? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the market certainly reflects this as we've seen one of our competitors um, be acquired by Lyft for the taxi top uh, manufacturing that they have done. Uh, I had mentioned them a bit earlier, their name is Halo. Um, and, and we actually do have some, um, some connections at, at you know Uber and Lyft and some of these um, some of these different rideshare companies that will provide us with a meeting once we're ready. Um, what we're more so focused on at the moment is making sure that with that one meeting that will be presented, we're not wasting it. We'd like to be on the market already. We'd like to have proven revenue streams that we can show to them. Um, because as a partnership is certainly something that exists, uh, there are certainly exit strategies and different things of the sort that we need to avoid ourselves from or, or to properly prepare for and so we're really working towards um, being market proven before we begin approaching some of those ideas. Excellent. Um, another question we have here is um, talk about the product life cycle of your specific e-bump. Um, and this is a multi-part question. So talk about the product life cycle. In other words, how long does it take to produce and how long will, it, you, will you plan for it to last? And 
is it weatherproof? Um, snow, rain, sun. Um, mm -hmm. So can you talk about that? Yeah. So so to begin with, um, they are weatherproofed. Um, they, they've been very, very heavily tested by our manufacturing firm. Um, so they are certainly weatherproofed, um, whether that be for glare or for the bumping that a car does while it dries and, and things like that. It's vibration tested. Um, it's certainly ready for all of those things. And so the life cycle of one is, is projected to be about a, uh, you know, a year and a half to five years. And it's, it's something that, that proves well because um, we hope that a driver has it as long as they possibly can. Um, we, we don't think that there's an overly high chance of, of stealing or robbing because they are locked in. It, it's rather hard to take it off if you are not the driver. If you don't know how to do it, if you don't have the small bolt key, um, it'll be really hard for you. If you're the driver, it's a really seamless thing to do. But for anyone else, it, it's a rather difficult thing. And so we, we, we think that the life cycle will be fairly long. Um, but similarly, we, we understand that the cost to uh, the cost to make one of these screens and then you add on the acquisition of a customer and things of that sort. Um, at, at current CPM levels, if we reach our, our average impression uh, value, we'll make that in a day or two. And so we, we, we do understand that um, the screens are important. We don't have a business without the screens, but the value is the system that we've then created. And so as important as the life cycle is, and, and we're doing everything we can to extend that life cycle as, as, you know, as best as we can, we understand that the screens are really just a mechanism to the software that we've created. Excellent. So we, we have some uh, other questions on that. I'm not able to get to all of those multi-part questions. So um, for, we will uh, address uh, some additional questions here. Um, so that we can um, help some of the other audience members that had some questions. The next question comes um, from the audience. Uh, the, the screens with their size uh, on the vehicle there, you seem a little small. Is it able that you, you can you actually make them bigger? Yeah. Or, uh, about, talk about the sizing. Yeah, sorry to cut you off. No, absolutely we can. Um, we, we think that we're gonna have a variety of different models. Um, we, we've, you know, since the beginning have had um, models drawn out where there are solar panels on top and they charge themselves rather than plugging into the cigarette lighter. Um, all, all of these things are certainly um, things that we will, we will be doing down the line. Um, you know, I, I, I read a really great quote by the, the I think it was the founder of, of LinkedIn, where he had essentially said, if you are not embarrassed of the first, um, the first product that you put out to market, you went to market too late. And so I'm not embarrassed of our screens. I think that they're fantastic. But I also do think in five years, when we look back at what we put on the market, they will be very, very different and, um, you know, certainly more modernized and, and uh, they, they will be better in five years is, is what I'm saying, <laughs> essentially. So yes, there will be bigger screens. There, there will be all sorts of things. Excellent. It is, uh, it is important to go to market uh, rather than overdevelop a product uh, just to continue to move forward and go to market and get marketplace acceptance and proof of concept. You know, a lot of companies do make mistakes of overdeveloping before they decide to go to market. And, you know, what you're doing is already getting that marketplace acceptance and, you know, you've already shown this to um, these contractors as well. I imagine you've also shown this particular model to Vistar Media and they've accepted this as an acceptable model. Yeah, they absolutely have. Um, so we have another uh, anonymous question here. Um that it has, so it has to plug into the cigarette lighter. Um, does that mean that if you install one, it would require any type of hand drilling through a door or a panel? Nope, um, we, we've seen systems. Uh, actually, there was another company maybe five years ago that built um, uh, essentially um, 
essentially electric bumper stickers. So they they were much smaller and they were on the tail light. They were called tail light, um, and they just showed pretty pictures. And so they built a model that does something similar, and it and it's really a small cord, so it can just tuck under the door as it's clothing closing. Um, and that's actually one of the selling points of us against our competitors is that when you when you are putting a halo on your car or something of the sort there's a professional team coming in drilling into your car whether it be the roof rack or or, or what have you there, there's something lasting on your car that you can't take off when our screens do um we have a, a you know three inch by three inch little metal slate that's maybe a quarter of an inch deep that you put onto your car with an adhesive it comes with um, you know, the proper anti-adhesive glue to get that off. So there'll never be a lasting mark. And at that point, it just slips on and slips off so that we're not having our users, uh, you know, comply to a long-term, you know, decision to, to really drill something in. When you have a halo on, on your car, you can't get into a garage, you can't go into a car wash, you can't do many things. And so we want to avoid that long-term commitment and allow someone to advertise as they please. Yes. Okay, we have another question here. Um, so it, when the car is driving, do you see the advertising when the car is driving or only when it stops at traffic lights or when it's driving slowly? No, you, you, you see it all of the time, but you'll see different value. And so when, when you're in a city, of course, the value will be pretty constant as you go because you're not actually reaching a very fast speed. But let's say you're on a highway, um, which you know our, our initial release won't have support from. We're, we're mainly going to be New York City based because it is location targeted. But in, in the future, we understand that if we have a CPM, which is essentially a cost per thousand impressions, if we have a CPM of five dollars uh, in Manhattan, and you're driving along the FDR highway, that that's probably going to bump you down to a really cheap CPM. Um, that is using facial detection on how many cars you go by or something of that sort. And so although it will still be, um, it will still be presenting advertisements because you still see billboards on the side of highways. Um, it'll be a much cheaper ad for a, for an advertiser to buy and it'll be more so name recognition based than location targeted. Excellent, Jonah. And as you mentioned, um, viewable, uh, CPM. This is more of a proprietary technology, which you're developing, which actually will um, look at the number of, from my understanding, maybe you can expand on this a little more, um, that this uh, actually uh, counts the number of viewers who can see this rather than just trying to project a number like most companies do. Can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah. So, so it's actually, it's interesting. Uh, the company Vistar Media when, when we were beginning our work with them, uh, they, were, they were explaining to us that they, they hold roughly 80% of the um, programmatic outdoor advertising market. And they had told us that the way that their system works, we will be using, um, we will be using historical impression data for all of the ads that they are placing on our cars. That being said, they had never heard of anyone um, physically counting the impressions themselves. We have a small screen or a small camera on our screens um, that takes screenshots of the street as it goes by. It uses facial detection to provide a count of how many people it's passed and then it returns the count and deletes the images so that we aren't storing any images. Um, you know, I as the CEO could not even view those images if I wanted to. Um, they just don't exist to us. And so we have a really accurate count of how many people are going by, which is unseen in the market. And so what we essentially understand from some very casual conversations with Vistar was that when we can weather test this, um, this facial detection software a bit better, um, and essentially that will just come through, through further driving, um, they see it as something that will have the ability to drive some of the competitors out of the way because then the agencies will not make decisions between similar uh, similar ideas, but they'll make decisions between less accurate and more accurate ideas. Yes. yes. So another more technical question here, Jonah, and, and uh, our time's almost up, but we'll 
allow you to answer this last question. And if you could, there's a couple of other questions that you may want to type an answer to uh, in your Q&A on the panelists. So maybe you can answer some of these other questions that have come up. Um, the, the next question I'd like to take is, um, so when, when the advertising, is it controlled from a central point um, on the internet or someplace like that? Or does uh, each driver select advertising and upload that via a USB stick? Or what, what is the process for selecting the advertisements for both the company and the drivers? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And, and similarly um, to some of the other things that we do, it, it's something that we do that that really no one else does, our competitors don't do, is that there are two ways to get ads onto screens. The first way is with programmatic advertising, which means that ViStar, an intermediary between advertising agencies and uh, digital out of home companies, they essentially act as you know someone who receives a check from an advertising agency and then displays those ads where they see fit through programs. Um, that's one way and that's something that we're doing and that's all that the other companies, Halo, Firefly, et cetera, do. We've also created an open exchange for our advertisements, meaning that similar to the Facebook system of running ads on Facebook, rather than having to be an advertising agency that wants to spend $100,000 on a campaign, you could very simply be a pizza shop on the Lower East Side and spend $25 and you can have your ads on different screens. And so what we do is we have our ad server that sits, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not on a thumb drive or anything of the sort, but we have our server that then connects to our mobile app that is what the drivers use as their middle point and essentially mirrors itself onto the screen. And so our server is what really does the grunt work and then sends over the queue of advertisements to the mobile app that it will then display onto the screen. And what the mobile app also does, uh, well, more so what, what a user does is they can allow certain filters so that they never find themselves um, advertising for a company that they don't align with. And they can also promote certain things like black owned businesses and female owned businesses and such so that they can have a certain say over what the ads they run are. Excellent job, Jonah. You, you definitely know your space, you know your technology. And you definitely have uh, given us some very good differentiators as to why eBumps is different from anything else that's out in the marketplace. Uh, I want to allow you to take some time to uh, get some water or take a take a breather. And if you could answer some of those other questions that came up in in the Q and A, if you could just type an answer and then dismiss those, I'd really appreciate that. But we do thank you again for presenting here. And we're going to move on to our next presenter. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, Jonah. Well, our next presenter uh, next up is Tribe Herald, led by CEO Yitz Jordan out of New York. It's a multicultural digital media company built on diversity from the ground up. Uh, they're starting with a Jewish community first. Tribe Herald is delivering one-of-a-kind experiences and building a community for 90 million users in the multicultural economy and experiences. Uh, and they're giving a voice to one out of every five who's not being represented by old fashioned and outdated media. So now you are up, it is your turn, Yitz. Uh, so please, please begin, thank you. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. <clears throat> Imagine an ice cream store with only five flavors or a paint store with only three or four colors. That's pretty much the media landscape that Trap Herald is going into, and that's the landscape that we are looking to disrupt. So like we said before, Trap Herald is a multicultural digital media com company built on community and diversity from the ground up. When looking at this picture, your average media company will say that they see five people, maybe five young people, maybe five young men. What we see is people who may, who may belong to any number of groups at the same time. People who've never been targeted on an identity level, on a intersectional level, on based on all the groups to which they belong. We're in the middle of a demographic shift in general, where 90 million Americans, as was said before, could be expected to be taking place in the multicultural economy. When it comes to media, 
that means an, a, a landscape which is old fashioned and ostracizes diverse communities in general. And that doesn't appreciate what's called now intersectionality, which doesn't appreciate multifaceted identities, which doesn't appreciate people's attachments to different cultures and communities at the same time. In fact, individuals have many unique needs and concerns that traditional media up until now is failing to address. Enter Tribe Herald. We're coming into an internet publishing landscape which shows no sign of slowing down really. 10.93% growth in this year, followed by 10.5% in 2021 and another 10% in 2022. 65% of internet users paid for some online content in 2019 with an average expenditure of $10 per user per month. This is a media consumption landscape that's being redefined by younger and younger users. Younger millennials and Gen Z are being defi are defining the new tech enabled entrepreneurial community building media landscape with an emphasis placed on sharing, an emphasis placed on social networking, an emphasis placed on an emphasis placed on getting messages out from one person to as many people as possible. And to Tribe Herald into this landscape. We call ourselves the digital consolidation of multiculture. People belong to multiple cultures, multiple communities. We want to be able, we want to exist there at the nexus of those communities, providing content, community building, and providing culturally competent media solutions for advertisers and brands looking to connect to consumers on levels that, um, on deep levels of engagement that they haven't been previously able to do. Now, we're going to initially concentrate on an underserved population within the Jewish community being Jews of color. That number corresponds to 20%, according to the Jews of Color Initiative, 20% of Jews in, um, Jews in America are ethnically or racially diverse. That means out of 8 million, at approximately 1.8 million people could be considered to be Jews of color spread out around the country. These are people who have not been targeted by any mainstream media out, many, any mainstream Jewish media outlet as of to date. 700,000 people in New York, 200,000 people in Los Angeles who have yet to see themselves represented in Jewish media. By choosing the Jewish community initially, this puts us in competition with established brands like the Jewish Journal in, based out of Los Angeles and the J Weekly based out of San Francisco, but it also places us in competition with national brands like The Forward who still publish in Yiddish. They're an over, over 100 year old brand Tablet Magazine, which is no friend to Jews of color and is, as has been shown by some of their recent content, and Israeli brands like Arut Sheva and Haaretz, which don't really concentrate on the needs of the diaspora in general the same way that an American Jewish media outlet would. And the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, is a newswire not really centered on community building and reaching users the same way that uh, Tribe Herald is. So going to market, we are basing our business model uh, largely on subscriptions with $9 per month as a subscription, bringing in $540,000 in revenue by the end of 2020, by 2022. Now, this is going to be combined with other revenue, such as, such as, such as community centers, such as, uh, such as workshops, webinars, things like that, bringing in $3.8 million of other dollars in other revenue for a grand total of $4.3 million in revenue by 2022. Our team, starting with me, the co-founder and CEO, I'm also the chief product officer. I've been a hip hop artist in the Jewish world for 20 years. I'm also a web developer by trade, and I was with Quartz for six years as one of as a senior web developer there. Chase Rishon is our editor. He's a three-time public author, and he was a former editor at Tablet Magazine. And our chief advisor, Jay, who uh, Jay Loft, who is the pre former publisher of Quartz, who took Quartz from a startup to a over, to a nine-figure acquisition in just over in just over six years. And Filling out the rest of our team, we have Tim as our CFO, uh, Rich Gora, who's the counsel, who's our general counsel, and Robin Washington, who has been active in Jews of color communities for about the past 20 years and who's been on public radio for about as long. So what have we done so far? In March, we launched our newsletter to small 300 subscribers. 
then we would have a Facebook page launched to about 500 followers in April. That would go up to 1,000 subscribers by June when we would launch the website and 4, 000, and to 4,000 users on the site. Then we would launch the store in uh, store Tribe Avenue in July. And now we have the newsletter, the store, multiple advertising contracts in, uh, in place and advertisers running on the site. The website's showing to 19,000 users monthly and 45 contributors from all over the world with the store bringing in 10,000 in sales. We looking, we're looking to scale that up to 100,000 users with 100 contributors from around the world. In addition to creating a co-working space complete with QSR in the co-working space to bring together that idea of community, in addition to pop-ups appearing across the country to bring the Tribe Herald experience of diversity and of diverse communities to various places, in addition to Spanish speaking and uh, and family oriented content coming out as well. We're also looking to expand to sponsored and branded experiences for brands that are looking to connect with underserved communities. So we're looking to raise 1.1 million in a convertible note. Uh, this, much, this money is going to be going to largely to hiring staff and to, and to producing more content for the site, for the mobile app, and for all of the other different platforms that we're currently operating on. A, lot, a large amount is going to go to securing and building out our first community center location. We're looking not only in the five boroughs of New York City, but also up in the Catskills region of New York, because this has traditionally been a vacation destination for the Jewish community. We're looking to establish a presence there as well. All the overhead and uh, advertising and PR expenses round out the rest of this. And then the crowdfunding deal at 250,000. A large part of this is going to customer acquisition and to marketing with portal fees and offering, offering expenses for the crowdfund and public relations app development. And yet again, increasing our staff and increasing our number of content creators, making up the rest of the use of those funds. And if there's any questions, please ask me. Thank you, Yitz. Uh, great job. Thank you for uh, presenting today. Um, so as we're uh, getting some questions in from the audience, uh, again, I remind you uh, from the audience, if you could type your question in, you can either type that in uh, anonymously, or you can also put that in with your name. I have been just uh, considering each and every person uh, anonymously. Um, what your question, if your name does go with your question, uh, your question is then seen by the audience as well. And the answer uh, is heard live as you, have you, as you have seen. And Jonah has gone through and typed in some answers to some questions. Um, so we have one here question that's coming in to, um, it, we have a question. Uh, so, let's talk about, this is a question, I have this question. So, with, it, with 90 million people that fall into this multicultural economy, um, that really doesn't sound like a minority group. You know, you talked about a demographic shift. Um, so, if that not being a minority, that sounds like a lot of people, you know, with there's maybe, what, 300 million uh, Americans and 90 million sounds like a, a very large chunk of that. So why why are these people being ignored in traditional media? And you know who are these people besides just the Jews of color? Uh, can you t expand on that a little bit? Well, like I was saying before, this um, these 90 million people are not not being targeted. This is a media driven economy. Of course, they're going to be targeted in some type of way, but not in the same way that Tribe Herald is. A person of color might be seen as only a person of color and might be expected to follow a certain paradigm or follow certain buying patterns without people thinking that, oh, well, this person's also Jewish. This is also a woman. This is also an immigrant. This is also someone from this group or that group. Tribe Herald tries to see people for their whole selves and is targeting people on a very deep identity level, whereas someone else may just be putting them into one of a few set categories. We're creating communities and creating products that see people as more multifaceted individuals than that, than the traditional media is seeing them currently. 
I see. So the, the more so the sense of this community and having an opportunity to belong, but not be necessarily labeled. Is that is exactly that what belonging without necessarily labeling belonging while con belonging connection without the feeling of division. OK. Um, I encourage you, if you have questions, to uh, ask additional questions. I see we still had coming in to the chat some, some additional questions uh, for Jonah with e-bumps. Um, and Jonah, if you feel like you want to answer that in the, in the chat, um, you're more than welcome to. Um, the other uh, questions that, that, that I have uh, for you, Yitz, is why go after Jews of color first? Why not broaden your initial entry to the, to the rest of this 90 million multicultural economy? So initially, we're going for Jews of color because, like I said, I'm a hip hop artist. I've been a hip hop artist in the Jewish world for 20 years and I've established myself as a voice for Jews of color. In, on various different platforms, and also, as has our editor, Chase Rishon, has really established himself as a name for Jews of color. So we're going to leverage our existing social fan bases and our existing fan bases of our customer base that we're going to start from within the community, within the Jewish community. This isn't the only community that we're going to be targeting. We're going to be also targeting the LGBT community and moving on to other underserved communities that exist at these intersections that aren't being served currently. Okay, great. Um, so we do we do have a, a question here. Um, I'm I'm not sure if this question is is meant for uh, e bump still or if we're. Uh, I think this does also relate to Tribe Herald. So let's let's uh, we'll ask this question here. So. What are, what are your direct customers that uh, will engage you? Uh, are you? Are you engaging with any larger agencies or, or uh, any other, um, other avenues to engage your customers? So on the one hand, of course, we have our subscribers and the people that are gonna be paying for our content on the various different platforms. And as far as the ad on the advertising side, um, we are engaging with uh, yes and we're doing both. We're operating on both fronts. We're engaging with agencies and also engaging directly with retailers. Um, so far, we've had more. We're little have more heavily dealing with boutique agencies, but we're also dealing with retailers directly. Got it. So that did answer that second question. There was a second part to that. Are you going direct with retailers? And. Uh, yeah, we are just yes, retailers and agencies, both brands that are looking to connect to underserved communities are looking to connect to people. Like I said before, on a really deep level, we have you know, over 30 percent open rate in our newsletter. People are always engaging with our content. So brands that are looking to do that and not just put themselves in front of an audience are generally the brands that come to us. Got it. You you mentioned before. I know you've talked to me about this. Uh, I, I get the privilege of, of hearing from you some more uh, than just this presentation. But uh, you mentioned before about early adopters to uh, different um, communities, and specifically, I remember us having a conversation about coffee, and we talked about Uban and the Jews, uh, the Jewish nation. So we talked about that. And so there's always some early adopters who do adopt things. Do you have really some great advocate stories that you can talk about on um, some of your early adopters? Oh, definitely. Um, we've had people, there's no shortage of messages into our Facebook inbox of this is the first time that I've ever seen someone that looks like me in an ad. This is the first time that I've ever seen someone that looks like me uh, being profiled in, uh, you know, in a publication. We've, um, when we interviewed um, Raquel Montoya Lewis, who's a Native American uh, judge who's, all, who's Jewish and from the uh, Northwest, she said, I didn't think anyone would research me to look into me, not knowing that there's a whole Native American Jewish community that's looking up to her. 
um, we're, we're the, the, the level of touch that people seem to be, seem to be the level of, uh, just gratitude that we're seeing from some of our early adopters is really touching to us too. Great. And so this is, but this is not just about Jews. This is about all these other people as well. I, I know that communities. It, you are targeting, you are targeting that market first. Uh, but this isn't just about that. This is larger than that. This is a bigger movement, more, more acceptance among others. I know that's, you're targeting that. Uh, and, as, uh, and as markets go, like I said, the Jewish community, LGBT community, and other underserved communities are going to be on our radar over the next uh, three to five years. Excellent. So, uh, is there any other questions that uh, we have from the audience? Uh, if, if we don't have any additional questions, we can move it to the poll because I, I'd like to thank you for your time. I know that you all have valuable time and all of you came here to join us to hear these two companies here today. Um, we do have a poll, it is anonymous. Um, we'd like you to participate so we know how we're doing and what things that we could bring you to make your experience better and what types of companies you would like to um, talk about or hear from, um, and what types of industries you would like to, uh, what, whether it's stage of the company, whether it is uh, what particular stage they're in or what particular industry they're in. Um, so do we have any other questions for uh, Yitz, uh, for Tribe Herald? And uh, as it looks like we don't, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put the poll up now and we're gonna launch the poll, give just a few minutes to, if you do have questions, uh, yet to stick around if you have questions. Uh, and if anyone has a, a question maybe that they wanted either Yitz or Jonah, Jonah's still here. So Jonah's still with us. Uh, if you have a question for either Yitz or Jonah, um, for either Tribe Herald or E-bumps, uh, we do encourage you to ask additional questions. This is for you. This is all about bringing you opportunities. This is for those, the two companies that presented here today. This is their opportunity um, to present and showcase and get some questions answered that you might have as a, as a potential investor or someone that just wanted to learn about their company or their particular industry. Um, this is for you. This is we're asking you to um, we're giving presenting this to you. We also uh, do appreciate your feedback uh, as an as a participant. Uh, we're asking you some simple questions here in the poll. Um, some of them are you only have one choice. Most of them you have multiple choices that you can uh, choose a couple of different answers from. Um, and so take, take a moment to answer those. We do appreciate your feedback. Again, it's anonymous. Um, we will uh, show the results so that the, uh, it won't show who voted which way or who, who answered which way, but it will show the audience as well, what type of audience we had here today. Um, I, I do, this was a, it's a privilege really to, to be able to uh, host events like this. We had a, previous event back in September where we had some networking following. And uh, there was a lot of value gained from uh, the networking, the one-on-one -on -one networking that was uh, there. We had some people join us after uh, a long day. We had, we had 11 companies present and five uh, investors, high profile investors and industry leaders present um, so it was quite a long day and we had people logging on and off. We wanted to be able to bring a shorter format where we could showcase maybe a couple of the companies uh, and still continue um, to allow them to showcase. And also we had some feedback that some of the company's uh, presentations weren't long enough or we weren't able to answer some of the questions that you had. So we went ahead and uh, we gave longer presentations here today um, to be able to accommodate that. Um, and we're hoping that you found value in this today. 
and we're hoping that you would join us in some other events. We do have um, another event uh, uh, scheduled for November and we have uh, another event coming up in December, which will be in Las Vegas. Uh, so in Las Vegas, uh, we have been working very hard to figure out the challenges with COVID. So we want an in-person event. Um, so we've been working very hard with the challenges of COVID. So bet Las Vegas gets 42 million visitors a year and a large number of those visitors come for conventions and there are over 6,000 conventions in Las Vegas every year. Um, the number of people who are coming to Vegas has definitely been limited because of COVID, COVID-19. Um, you know, we obviously have to be safe and we have to be mindful of that. We have to, our health is a very big concern. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're uh, staying healthy and safe and we're not um, infecting anybody else or being exposed where we shouldn't be. And so those conventions, like for example, CES, which is normally held in January, um, I actually don't know what's happening with CES. I haven't actually followed it, so I can't tell you that uh, I have an update or anything on that. Uh, but that attracts 100,000 visitors to Las Vegas every year. And uh, there are 85,000 hotel um, rooms, hotel and casino rooms on the Strip. So as you can imagine, that fills up quite a bit of the town in a four mile uh, Strip. Um, that has been restricted. We are now restricted to have 250 people that can uh, be in one area uh, gathering. So we just, we have to keep social distancing. We gotta be mindful of that. And uh, you know, there's, there are people that still want to come to Vegas though. So we're giving them that opportunity. We're uh, putting together a in-person event in Las Vegas, um, tentatively now scheduled for December the 16th through the 20th. Um, we will also have a global presentation like this one to um, beginning the week before. Uh, so if you're up for traveling to Vegas and you'd like to come say hi and you'd like to actually see somebody in person Maybe it'll be six feet away, but uh, you can actually see us, look us in the eye and say hello, um, smile and uh, share some time together and see some companies that are gonna be presenting and learn from some really fabulous speakers, some top investors. Um, we're uh, getting uh, investors from all around the globe and uh, they'll be speaking live. Uh, they're in person as well. We're having top industry leaders. Um, so we have a, quite a demand for companies and, and uh, presenters that wanted to. Today, my phone was blowing up uh, the uh, different investors that wanted to speak today. So also, if you want an opportunity to speak at an event like this, um, we, will op we do open that up. Uh, we're, we're always looking for uh, speakers. Uh, we have through this platform, we have some other platforms where we have investor judges who ask the questions. And um, so we're looking for investor judges. We're looking for speakers who want to be able to educate the audience. Um, we look at this as an educational experience as well. So we like uh, your input. And as an investor uh, and as industry leaders, we want to hear from you. Um, and our audience wants to hear from you. Uh, last uh, in September, we heard from David Mandel, a super angel who's invested in over 500 companies. And most everyone there, the audience said they overwhelmingly at, uh, said they were educated the most by him. We also had uh, some other industry leaders uh, presenting and speaking. Um, uh, so we're going to uh, close our polls here in a minute. Um, I know you just heard me speak for probably about seven minutes, and that's probably about all that I'd like to do here today. Uh, 
if anybody knows me, they uh, we've got to we've got to rein this in. So let's uh, make sure that uh, we we close the polls now. If you last sec uh, last chance to go ahead and answer the polls, I see that we're about forty percent of you have answered the poll. So I just would like to see that at least get up um, to over fifty percent, so I can close the poll. So I'd encourage you to answer the questions. They are anonymous. It helps us with our feedback so we can give you the most value. And we do thank you again for coming here today. And also, again, reminder, uh, and I will put this in the chat. If you wanna contact these companies, their contact information is on the Linked Ventures website. Uh, it's under offerings. So you'll visit the Link Ventures web website, which I'm putting in the chat now, linkventures.net. And you can go to the offerings section. There you can find the contact of the in contact information from the uh, companies that presented here today. We're also adding additional contact information from different investors who have asked us uh, to be in our directory. Uh, different things like this is free for you to go to. Um, you don't have to pay for this to go and um, get access to this information. Um, this doesn't cost you anything. We aren't asking you. We are asking your time and we appreciate you to time out of your schedule today. Um, so we just reached 50% on the poll. If I could get one more person um, to fill out the poll then I know we're above 50%. Uh, so if we could just get one more person, to please, if you haven't done so, fill out the poll so I can close it and say that we re at least reach more than 50%. Um, it, it looks like if I could get one more person, that's gonna push us over that edge. That's gonna give me that extra little minute number that I need. Um, so please do uh, answer. Um, there's eight questions there. Uh, please do answer those if you can, so that we can uh, close out the poll. I do appreciate you coming and taking time out of your day. I'm going to give you back, uh, if you can give me one person to fill out the poll, I'm going to give you back 28 minutes today because we had this scheduled till 1230 p.m. Pacific time. So if I can just get one more person to answer the poll questions I'll close that and you won't have to hear from me talking anymore. <laughs> um, is there, while, while we're waiting for that one person to fill out the poll, um, I'm gonna scan the chats and see if there's some questions maybe that we had that were unanswered. I didn't see that. And actually on the polls, the panelists are not allowed to answer the polls. So um, there we go. We just hit that. I'm going to end the poll. Thank you so much for joining us today. I encourage you to look at linkventures.net for some more opportunities. Thank you to our presenters today, Jonah uh, Tuckman from eBumps. Thank you. Yitz Jordan from Tribe Herald. Thank you, Vinod, who supported us with our technical support. Thank you, and thank you all for attending. Great. I will see you guys at the next event, and I will end the poll so you can see the results. And uh, I'll just share a couple of things real uh, thing here that uh, I think is interesting to everyone. So the question we asked was, would you like to see more companies like these? And the, Looks like 90% said yes. So that's that's great. Um, we it looks like we are a very diverse crowd here. We're looking to uh, for companies in several different industries and several different stages. But we did have a very large percentage that want to see series A. So um, you're going if you missed September 25th, go back check the linkedventures.net site. We had some companies there that were um, series A or beyond, 
and there are some videos specifically i i remember exactly we had um get spiffy so if you want to check out get spiffy they were beyond series a so if you wanted to go look at a company that was in that stage that's a little further along in their development you can look definitely look at them and they're looking in in their further along in their investment stage um so i really uh, enjoyed this today i Thank you again for your time. Uh, we're going to dismiss everyone now uh, and we will leave the meeting. And uh, I thank you again. Uh, we hope to see you again.